You are listening to KC Sports Network, the number one podcast network for today's Kansas City sports fans. With former players from your favorite teams, informed perspectives, and former insiders, this is the place for you. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts or on our YouTube channel, all over social media, or our morning newsletter, KCSN Daily, dedicated to your Kansas City Chiefs. KC Sports Network is proudly presented by Emprise Bank, your partner in Possible. Welcome into another Three Mob Podcast. I am John Kurtz, joined by Cole Manbeck and Derek Young. You know Derek from K-State Online. Cole Manbeck, former beat writer for the Manhattan Mercury, has covered K-State for a very long time. We have no guests today. It is just us, but uh, we will recap what happened last time, which was Adrian Martinez, who was excellent, but it's been the aftermath of that that's been really interesting with Nebraska fans and the way that that, uh, that story, some of his comments got uh, taken and picked up and circulated We will get to all of that. We're going to talk football because, hey, all of a sudden, K-State is a media darling. I don't know if you've been paying attention this week to national media, but they apparently just woke up and decided this week to make K-State a dark horse contender in the Big 12, which is something, obviously, I think in K-State circles we've been saying for a while. And the NBA withdrawal entry deadline was was today, so we will talk about where where that could affect K-State hoops and recruiting and transfers moving forward. Before we do that, though, need to give a special shout-out to uh, Holiday Distillery. They bring you 360 Vodka. We've talked a lot about 360 Vodka. Certainly, if you uh, have something to celebrate, you're trying to take the edge off on the weekend, whatever it is, 360 Vodka has you covered. But for those bourbon drinkers among us, uh, which I know Cole and DY certainly are in that category, we have Ben Holiday Bottled and Bond Bourbon that is now out from Holiday Distillery that I've seen nothing but rave reviews for. I know our guy BJ Kissel loves it. And uh, look, I'm not calling you guys alcoholics or anything. I'm just saying you like your bourbon. So I would imagine that you guys would be very interested in this as well. I'm sure, Cole, that you could uh, swallow pack about seven of these and then pop up at 6 a.m. the next morning, no problem, and go for a jog. Well, I'm going to sure give it a try. I'm going to give it a test run here in the near future. i got to go pick up a bottle, and I'm going to let you guys know how I feel about it. I'm sure I'm going to love it. Uh, D.Y., I, I don't know. You may you, you may have to battle more of a hangover because you seem more like a mere mortal like myself. I am definitely a mere mortal. That doesn't mean I won't try it, though. Okay. All right. We're all on board. Uh, Ben Holiday Bottle and Bond Bourbon from uh, Holiday Distillery. Check it out, guys. They support us. So please support those who support us. Okay. Adrian Martinez. I I think it's fair to say uh, he supported us with the content that he supplied last time around here on the show. He was excellent. And look, I mean, I came away thinking that's just a really impressive kid. And and not even kid. I should need to not get in that habit. That makes me seem very old. He was a very impressive young man, a very impressive leader, very charismatic. He's a, a grown ass man. Yes, yes, he is. Yes, he is. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of traits in there that I think you can pick up on and really like and see how that translates to being a good quarterback. Now, again, we've watched him for four years at Nebraska, struggle to ever fully realize that potential. But at K-State, you can see that there are some building blocks there to work with if the infrastructure is actually better in Manhattan. And isn't that an interesting topic, whether or not the infrastructure and the talent around him is a better situation than what he had at Nebraska? Because Adrian Martinez said that it was. And look, we heard that and thought, well, hey, that's an interesting comment that we certainly need to highlight. I did not imagine that it was going to get the run that it did because that got picked up by Unnecessary Roughness, which is a barstool show. Um, it got picked up by the Daily Caller, some Nebraska fan sites. Uh, it really made the rounds a lot of places, and Nebraska fans seemed very upset by these comments, which there is a weird cognitive dissonance with running to a megaphone to say, hey, we had tons of talent. We just sucked at utilizing it because we win four games every year. So take that. But that seemingly has been the Nebraska response to all of this. So uh, I – I was surprised by that. I guess I underestimated the insecurity of Nebraska fans right now, but I, I how, how do you take this? Cole, I saw you you giggle in there. How, how do you take the reaction from Nebraska fans to what Adrian had to say? 
Well, I, I didn't think it would blow up the way it did, but I, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised given the uh, false reality Nebraska fans live in in terms of their viewpoint of where they sit in the college football landscape and also just how insecure Nebraska fans are. I mean, they, they took great offense to that. I don't know what they thought Adrian Martinez should say. Should he say that, oh, this team's going to be mediocre? There's, you know, they're not, we're not as good as the team at Nebraska. I mean, come on, just, just be realistic here. And I, I had no issue with what Adrian Martinez said. I, I appreciate his transparency and his honesty, how insightful he was, his perspective on everything. And uh, I really enjoyed hearing from him. And it's unfortunate Nebraska fans feel that way. But the reality is, you know, I, I think Adrian Martinez, a lot of his struggles at Nebraska just go back to the actual talent. I mean, you look how bad his offensive line was on that side of the football. And Adrian Martinez has talked about, needing to cut down on his turnovers. Well, I think a lot of the turnover issues at Nebraska have to go back to do with the offensive line. He was pressured 159 times last season. The next closest power five team of pressures allowed was Virginia at 136. All right. This is one of the worst offensive lines in college football. If you include the FCS, they ranked 282nd out of 295 college football teams at the division one level FBS and FCS combined in terms of QB pressure rate allowed, pass block efficiency grades from pro football focus. Their tackles were the worst in college football. Turner Corcoran, and D, why am I saying the name right? He's a Lawrence kid, free state. Yeah, you know, he scored a zero on pro football focus's pass blocking grade scale. A zero. I didn't know it was possible. He scored a zero. He was the left tackle for Nebraska this last year. Uh, yeah, so they, they just, a lot of it goes back to that and, I think Nebraska fans need to accept that. I think Adrian Martinez is really going to benefit from a much better improved offensive line. And, you know, despite that, you, you look at his numbers last year, he had 9.4 yards per pass attempt. That ranks sixth best in the country. Skylar Thompson was eighth in the country at 9.1 yards per pass attempt last year. So, and they went against some very difficult defenses. You know, they played three of the top 12 defenses in the country in points per drive allowed. So uh, yeah, it's, it's hilarious to be the way Nebraska fans took his comments. Um, I was very much enjoying it, and I was trying to egg them on on Twitter with some of these stats that I just read to you uh, because I very much enjoy uh, engaging with Nebraska fans and their false sense of reality. You know, you, you, you were doing a good job, Cole, but let me just interject here and say that in the future, you need to be a little more of a, of a dick when you do it. OK, you got it. You were a little too nice and a little too statistical based. You have to have a little more of an edge, man. That's how you really poke and prod people online. Well, all right. Not that I would. That's what a friend told me. Well, I, I know that you are the best at this. All right. You are the best at trolling other fan bases. You even you trolled Illinois fans with the Brad Underwood stuff so well as well. I, I very much enjoy that. I my my performance and the way I go about it is very much fact based. So I like to just go at them with straight facts and then watch them squirm and see how they try to argue that. And, you know, it, it seemed to shut a lot of them up. You know, the, the comments really didn't occur. Um, the other thing I'll mention on Adrian Martinez real quick, and we didn't get a chance to really ask him this on the podcast, but I, given the ex expectations that Nebraska fans have, he's been there, the starting quarterback for four seasons, right? There's a lot of pressure. I really think Adrian Martinez, one of the things I'm so optimistic, he's an incredibly bright, he's a very talented kid guy he's not a kid right uh but i think he's going to benefit greatly from a fresh start uh you know just getting out of the shadows of nebraska they lost 20 games by one possession or less at nebraska mm -hmm. one score game under adrian martinez so 20 of their 29 losses while he was the starting quarterback occurred by one score i saw a lot of their fans going to that stat and you know enjoy getting ready to lose by one possession but the reality is I just think I, I have to think your psyche, the mental mentality of you late in games, when you're constantly in that situation, you just kind of get in that here we go again mentality. And then you have a poor offensive line and the defense is, is pinning their ears back going after you. Yeah, I, I think that certainly plays a part. I just think he's going to benefit from a fresh start here, a better offensive line, a much better offensive line and a competent head coach. Yeah, it, it didn't even register to me when Adrian provided that answer to us um, that it was going to blow up in the, the manner or the fashion that it did. And that, I guess that's probably two pronged. One, because I guess I didn't think that you you know someone would be so 
sensitive and offended by that comment, especially to kind of seek it out and for it to go viral the way that it did. You, you think that they, you know, if they felt that way, then they should probably feel better that he's gone instead of like being offended. And and secondly, I think it's probably because I heard it and I'm just probably nodded in agreement. Like there's not a whole lot of evidence there to suggest the opposite or otherwise. I mean, they're, they haven't made a bowl since what, 2017, 2018, I think. So, I mean, that in itself is pretty alarming. If you're a Husker fan, I imagine Kansas State's made, you know, three, three or four in that time span. Uh, they didn't during the COVID year. And I was, and, and then Bill Snyder's last year. But other than that, they've, they've still been a common stay um, in a bowl game. And they, they are, I mean, the truth is they are more talented than Nebraska. And that really can't be argued. And certainly probably this year, I mean, there is a chance and I'm sure we'll touch on it at some point in this off season where Kansas state has upwards of six, seven guys drafted um, next April. That's a very real possibility. Um, this is one of the more talented teams that they've had in some time. And, and Nebraska is not really hitting those numbers, especially, you know, on the offensive line where that's been a challenge for them. And, and this is really a challenge for them, right? Either Adrian Martinez is right and they're not, as talented as Kansas as Kansas State, or he's wrong and they are, and their coaching is that terrible that yeah. they've been this bad for so long. Here's the and here's the probably the the tough dose of reality. If any Nebraska fans listening to this, it's probably both. You're probably less talented, and you probably do have an inferior coaching staff. Well, some of it, like, and I got a little bit of this pushback from even some like local media around here, like regional media, I would say mm. um, of like, well, I mean, look at the recruiting rankings, like Nebraska, of course, is out recruiting K-State when you look at the recruiting rankings every year, but it's, it's about like, what are the finished products, which again, ties in coaching. And so I guess some of it is, you know, how do you define just pure raw talent? Are you taking just the recruiting evaluations or are you taking like what these guys actually are as players? But yeah, if we're talking about like what this team is, I think there's definitely a case that you could say this team is a, a better team. If you want to maybe removing the word more talented and just saying like better team around him, I think that's very fair because like Deuce Vaughn, I mean, Deuce Vaughn is a better player than anybody that Adrian Martinez played with. And, Absolutely. And Absolutely. Um, and, and here's another thing. When you say more talented, it, it isn't how talented they were as a high school player. I mean, Deuce, Deuce Vaughn is a very talented college player that people didn't give credit in high school, right? So just looking at those recruiting rankings, like guys get better from their senior year in high school right. to their junior year in college. So you could still be more talented even if you are inferior in the recruiting rankings because guys can get more talented. Cooper Beebe is a perfect example to what you were saying, D.Y. I mean, he was a guy that was a defensive tackle coming out of high school. K-State moved them. You know, you thought he was going to be better suited at guard, and now he's turned into an all-Big 12 tackle. So uh, I think he's a great example of that as well. DY, I do want to jump in. Um, I don't want to give, I don't want you to give in Nebraska any more credit than they are. Their last bowl appearance was December 30th, 2016 in the Music mm -hmm. City Bowl. So it's been 2016. And don't forget the Foster Farms Bowl in 2015 when Nebraska got in with five wins, I believe, because of the, uh, the lack of bowl eligible teams and Nebraska jumped on that and beat UCLA at the Foster Farms Bowl. So um, good for Nebraska for accomplishing that feat, but it's been a long time since they've been in a bowl. Uh, and look, you also, you mentioned Deuce guys. Uh, we asked him about Deuce. I think that's going to alleviate a lot of the pressure on Adrian Martinez. So you have a guy that's a security blanket coming out of the backfield who can catch everything and he can take it the distance he can make a lot of first downs by making guys miss just on a simple flare or dump off pass. He also is obviously a tremendous running back. And you look at what Adrian Martinez had to do at Nebraska the last couple of years. He led, he led the big 10 with 415 scramble yards out of scramble situations last season. The next closest quarterback in the big 10 was the Iowa quarterback, I believe with 106 yards. It might not have been Iowa, it might've been Rutgers, but it was, a, it was a little less uh, than 115 yards, the next closest quarterback. So he was constantly running for his life. He led Nebraska in rushing attempts each of the last three seasons. He led Nebraska in rushing yards each of the last two seasons. So he's going to have a guy like Deuce now that takes the pressure off his shoulders, helps keep him healthy, and gives him that security blanket out of the backfield. So that's just a huge piece that I think is really going to benefit him and the rest of the roster. 
And again, it's it's not really rocket science to put together the case for how this team is better. You know, because I mentioned Deuce, again, I think better than anybody that Adrian played with there. The offensive line we've talked about, I think will be worlds better than anything he ever played with at Nebraska. And then, you know, we're talking about on the defensive side of the ball, like Felix and DK Uzama, Cooper Beebe on the offensive side of the ball. Like th- that's that trio that DY has referred to before, like guys that could be all Americans, three potential all Americans there. Throw in Khalid Duke, Julius Brent, Echo Boido. I mean, like there are a lot of pretty talented players on this team. And, and I don't think it's a ridiculous case or K State fans being, you know, too high, too optimistic or anything like that to, to really make that case. But the, the overarching point here, this is one of those like very off season y kind of arguments where we find ourselves discussing whether or not K State or Nebraska is better. And, you know, was what do Adrian Martinez's comments mean? Which obviously, whether it's true or not, deep down in his heart, he's going to say that now because he's on that team. But it, it's actually been backed up now by the athletic. And this kind of parlays into the next topic, which is we saw a run of three national publications this week. All of a sudden, all three basically call K State a dark horse contender for the Big 12 championship, one of those being the athletic. And here it is from Max Olson. He says, uh, can, a, can a more aggressive Adrian Martinez led offense make K State a uh, Big 12 contender? We're right on that doorstep. And then in the article, it said Adrian Martinez, quote, should benefit from playing with a better supporting cast. So there you have it. I mean, that's that's Max Olson of the Athletic, like a guy that covers the league and and is, I believe, a Nebraska grad or at least covered the Nebraska football program and lives in the state of Nebraska. So uh, I hate to break it to you, Husker fans, but it ain't just us. It ain't just Adrian Martinez. It's, it's also now a, a national media, regional media that would agree with this statement. And I know we're going to dig into that now. Uh, I guess that trend that really started from this trio of outlets, they just all woke up this week and decided to realize that Kansas State is going to be a threat to win the Big 12. I think most of us that have, I guess we cover and follow the K-State program year round, I think we've been feeling that, you know, for a while about this this year's upcoming team. It's not to say this is the best roster in the Big 12 or maybe not even the second best roster but this is those, you know, you always have one in every four or five years if you're a Kansas State tie program where you do the, the everything comes together where you have one of your better rosters in four or five years. And those are the years that you have to capitalize and potentially win a Big 12 championship because the, that's your best chance in that three, four year window. And this is that year for Kansas State. Just the stars are aligning. Um, they, you know, had a decent season last year, probably scut, scut, uh, scuffled down the stretch, whether that be the Texas game or the Baylor game where the, you know you went from 7-3 and three to 7-5 and five in a flash and not feeling great about yourself. You fire your offensive coordinator. But if you just even erase that two-game stretch, I mean, you won 7 of 10 games. I think they still finished in the top 20 of SP Plus by, at the end of the year. Um, and that was without Skylar Thompson f- for a few games. So it's – and you, when you bring back your best players, we talked about that trio of potential All-Americans. I, th- I think it's safe to say they might not even be a dark horse. I think that's kind of just being too gentle. I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but when you're you know, winning eight games in two uh, the last three years and this team is probably demonstrably more talented than those two clubs, your best players from last year's team, that won eight games is back. I just think that's kind of undershooting it a little bit. I just kind of generally feel like the program where it's at now, it's if there's ever a year where they're going to be a contender or people feel like they have a chance to be a contender, it's going to be labeled as dark horse because that's what the perception of the program is. Like back in the, you know, when it was rolling from 97 to 03 and K-State was winning 11 games, six out of seven years, it it was not like K-State's a dark horse contender. They were a contender year in and year out and everybody was used to it and you could see the talent uh, out there on the field, it was very apparent to everybody that they were legitimate contenders. Now, I mean, even think about, you know, 2011. K-State wins 10 games, goes to the Cotton Bowl in 2011, and they were picked, I believe, sixth the next year in the Big 12 preseason poll. Like, nobody saw that run coming in case they wound up number one in the BCS for a portion of that season and flirted with the national championship game. So that, that I think, is just kind of the reality now of where the program's at. It's always going to be under this label – as dark horse. And if you want the specifics here, who we're referring to Bill Connolly of ESPN um, who puts together the S and P plus the DY just mentioned there. He said, this is a tweet. Hello, I'm Bill Connolly and I'm officially talking myself into Kansas state for 2022. Anyone want to join me on this potentially doomed expedition, which 
depending on how superstitious you are there, Bill Connolly uh, kind of sees that as like a negative kiss of death. If he thinks that he's going to be really high on a team, uh, that's what he's referring to there. But then we had, I mentioned the Max Olson article from The Athletic where the headline is, get a more aggressive Adrian Martinez-led offense, make K-State a Big 12 title contender. Quote, we're right on that doorstep. And that was a quote from Chris Klein. Uh, then you have Mike Farrell Sports, who I don't know a ton about, but they have 160,000 followers. It's a pretty big account. Comes through with an article that says Kansas State is the dark horse candidate nobody is talking about in the Big 12. All three came within a 48-hour stretch earlier this week. So I don't I don't know as far as like why it happened now. I think that's kind of the puzzling part to me. I guess we're just at that stage in the offseason where everybody's going through kind of doing their team previews and trying to fill time and and in going through those team previews, they kind of realize, oh hey, wait, like their K-State's got some really high level talented dudes here and added quite a bit of depth in the transfer portal. Right, that would be my only hypothesis, but I think unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, it's always going to be under this dark horse label until the program were, if they were to go on some run here of three, four, five years in a row of really contending. Yeah, that's fair. My, my, I guess my observation would be that they're too late. I mean, you bring back, you have a quarterback. I guess you don't bring him back, but Adrian Martinez, that's started for a Power Five program for four years and has played at a high level, even if he has a turnover issue. You have a, an All American running back. You have an All-American left tackle probably in Cooper Beebe and two other guys that have started a lot of games or are expected to start a lot of games when you have Taylor Portier to come back from his injury and uh, Christian Duffy, I think, has started for two full seasons at this point. And then a fourth guy that's played significant snaps in Hadley Panzer if they choose to go that route as well. And KT Leviston has seen a lot of playing time too, whether it be a guard or tackle. Um, tight ends probably where they had the least – bit coming back you, you hope you get something from samuel wheeler wide receiver rooms not necessarily dynamic but that's a ton of experience there's a lot of football that's been played by that group whether it be Cade warner malik Knowles, and philip brooks and some, probably some other guys that left out then defensively the all-american that we probably um i've already talked about and felix andy dk Uzama, khalid duke back from injury and he's already made a splash nate matlack as i think my God, it can be all Big 12 this season that nobody's talking about. And I think defense coordinator Joe Klanderman would probably agree. I think Daniel Green is an all-conference type player and linebacker. Yeah, forgot about they, it. Yeah, they like what they, they've seen out of Will Honus already. A transfer from Nebraska, go figure. Um, two all Big 12 caliber cornerbacks. Um, safety is probably where you, you get a little, a little scary about when it comes to the defense. They lost all three starters from a year ago, so that's probably the question mark. But that's also where they added the most depth through the transfer portal. So you you like what they've done and addressing where the voids might be. And then you love what they bring back in terms of the talent because the best players on last season's team outside of maybe Skylar Thompson, right, are all back for this season. It's the most talented team that Kansas State's had in terms of an overall roster since 2016. I mean, it's clearly Chris Kleiman's most talented, experienced team that's coming back. It's going to key on a few things. Adrian Martinez is going to have to stay healthy. Deuce Vaughn's obviously going to have to stay healthy. Uh, they don't have a ton of depth at the running back position, except for the freest kid they brought in out of the Juco ranks. And and hopefully he can step in and give Deuce a breather now and then. Yeah, Daniel Green, you guys mentioned him. I think he's a first-team All-Big 12 linebacker. I think he's a stud. I, he had like 16, 17 tackles for loss last year. Flew all over the place, had by far and away his best season. Eli Huggins is back at the D-tackle position. He's one of the better nose tackles probably in this conference. Gives you experience there. You love the corners. You know, I think Christian Duffy on the offense side of the ball, I think he's got to have a better season at right tackle. He struggled a little bit last year. He's got to protect Adrian Martinez um, and step forward again and get back to more of what he was a couple years ago. Uh, but, yeah, I love the, the talent, especially on the front lines, you know, in terms of first string guys. It's going to be a question of some of the depth guys that step in and can help build that. You know, obviously Jordan Wright is a huge addition at the cornerback room. DY, you wrote a, a nice piece about him this week and about some of the other offers that came in for him after he agreed to come to K-State. So that's a huge pickup. And then Forsha obviously uh, was a significant pickup in beating out USC and some other high profile programs at the linebacker position. So uh, really like the depth that they've built here over the last few weeks and, and think this is a team that certainly can challenge to get to the Big 12 championship. We've been saying it for a couple months now. And, you know, when you look at the, the landscape of the Big 12 conference, I mean, Lincoln Riley's gone. So Brent Venables, K-State plays them right off the bat to start Big 12 play. 
you got a Brent Venables coach team. I, I think there's going to be some bumps in the road this season for him and his first time head coach. I think K-State's got a real opportunity to go to Norman. That's a good time to catch them in my eyes. And then you've got a new coach at TCU. Now, I know Gary Patterson wasn't very good the last few years, but new coach there in, in Sonny Dykes. you got a new coach at Texas Tech. So there's a lot of new coaches in the conference that Kansas State's got one of the more experienced guys now in Chris Kleiman. And then Matt Campbell at Iowa State, obviously a very experienced coach, but I think Iowa State's going to be down a little bit. They lost a lot of talent. You know, we all know how experienced they were coming back last year, but a ton of those weapons are now gone. So you look at Kansas State's roster comparative to the rest of the Big 12. You look at the coaching staff compared to the rest of the Big 12. They haven't had a ton of turnover on the coaching staff other than a couple of positions that we all agreed with making changes at. So I, I like where K-State's at, and I, I certainly think they have a chance to be a challenger here for it to get to Arlington. You make a really good point about the rest of the league because one, one thing I saw early on from some when, you know, it was like, and I forget specifically who um, I should remember, but it was a a national or regional reporter on Twitter who was getting questions from K-State fans about like, hey, wh why is there not more love for K-State contending? And I saw the schedule pointed out a couple of times early on. So K-State goes to Oklahoma, to Iowa State, to TCU, to Baylor, to West Virginia. Um, a lot of Big 12 road trips, obviously with the schedule flipping, 5-4 there, and then some tougher, tougher road trips. Uh, for K-State to deal with as well. I, I understand that, but I think the point that Cole makes is as valid as anything. Like you, you have a pretty veteran team. You got a pretty veteran coaching staff relative to the rest of the league. And like when when else are you going to step into a Big 12 season where Oklahoma, at least at one point in time, now I know OU fans revolted over this, but Stuart Mandel of The Athletic, for instance, had Oklahoma out of the top 25 at one point this offseason. Now I think they're going to be a top 25 team but if that is the perception of Oklahoma, that is so far gone and so far different from what we've experienced over the last two decades, like 20 years uh, in the Big 12 for OU. And, and it's not like this is the time when Baylor and TCU were up at the top of the league running at the peak of their powers in 2013 and 2014. That's, that's not the case. There's a lot of transition in the league. And, you know, I, I know we kind of do it every year, but if we're really – pushing five and seven Texas up near the top, like the second best team in the league, second best odds to win the league, second best odds to get to the playoff from the league. I mean, it should tell you a lot about what the rest of the landscape is. I like Dave Aranda. I like Mike Gundy, particularly the consistency that Gundy has brought. Aranda showed a lot last year, but there's still big question marks at both Oklahoma State and Baylor as to whether or not they're going to be on anywhere near the same level that they were last year. So if there were ever a year where the league is wide open and pretty ripe for somebody to rise up like AK State, this this would be the year. I would agree with that. And you spoke some of those teams, but I will say there's a stretch that I think is going to dictate just if this is a solid season for Kansas State or a great to special season. And it's games eight, nine, and 10 at the end of October to the middle of November or right in a row they're probably playing the other three teams, maybe aside from Oklahoma, that we think could contend for a Big 12 championship right in a row. Oklahoma State, Texas, and Baylor, one after another. At the end of the season, if they really are contending with those teams, those games bring on probably far more magnitude. And as you said, Kurtz, it, um, tr some tricky road games, but two of those are at home. Yeah, well, I mean – We'll do a ton of schedule analysis, I'm sure, before this is all said and done and, and the season starts. But I mean, even just looking at the, the beginning of the conference schedule, two of the first three games are at Oklahoma and at Iowa State, two teams that have been uh, obviously very good here recently, but are, are definitely in kind of rebuild, retooling mode. And you get them right out of the shoot in the first three games of Big 12 play. Like I think and, and Iowa State has been a bugaboo for Chris Kleiman and for the K-State program ever since 2018 when they broke through and, and finally beat K-State. So the amount of confidence that could be gained from winning that game, I mean, I kind of circle that dates. Like Oklahoma, if you're going to lose at Oklahoma, you can still make the Big 12 championship game. I think everybody understands. But I, that's a game that really stands out to me early on on the schedule. Like you got to go beat Iowa State. You got to take care of that one for a number of reasons. My personal pride and Twitter account, namely among <laughs> them. But uh, yeah. you, you got to go take care of that one. Yeah, that makes sense. And I will say two other games, and it's two of the three that I already mentioned. I don't think Chris Kleiman, I think there's two teams in the Big 12 he still has not defeated, right? Texas, he has not defeated. And I, is it Oklahoma State? Yeah. Or is ba Baylor too? Yeah, I think it's all three, right? Yeah, it would yeah. be all three. 
and he plays those three right in a row at the end of the year. Look, look, it's a big, it's a big season for Chris Kleiman. I mean, there's nothing wrong with winning seven or eight games like they've done the last couple of years, but this is kind of their chance to get over that hump. And 2023 is likely going to be a little bit more of a struggle. DY, you mentioned all the guys are going to have drafted. There's going to be a lot of turnover on the roster. A lot of talent is going to probably be gone next season that they have this year. So this is their chance to really make that run. And if they can make that run, it'll help them in recruiting down the road and it'll kind of get them over that proverbial hump. You know, I'm thinking if, if they could win nine plus games in the regular season, that would be a big success and uh, certainly be great for Chris Kleiman and, and Kansas State fan base. I think everyone would be happy with that. So this is that opportunity to get over the hump with some of that returning talent and all the pieces they have. They have to have their best season under Kleiman, I think. And obviously eight's been the max. So I'm not saying if it's a failure if they only win eight games, but this is the year where you got to take it to another level. It's, it feels like it almost has to be at least nine. And, and I think Kleiman realizes that and knows that. And I know you have to have an athletic subscription and people have a lot of feelings one way or the other about the athletic. I, I still do really appreciate the actual pieces that they put out there. And it was, it was a good read. Um, but the, the quote from Chris Kleiman about like, I feel like we're right on the doorstep. Like he, he realizes you, it was very apparent from the article. Like he realizes the position that he's in right now, that he's, he's kind of gone through it. I mean, he talked about like 2019, they didn't even know what they were going to have on the roster when they came in. Um, and then COVID really disrupted things in 2020. So it's like just now feeling like he's been here, feet under him, had a chance to recruit, develop some guys, turn it into what he wants his program to be. And now feels like, hey, we've got some dudes and this is the best team that I've had. And it's time to go out and win some games. And it, it would not hurt. I'm not saying anything realignment wise is going to change because of one football season here. Um, but with the transitional period here in the Big 12 and new teams coming in and wondering what the future of the college football world is going to be, it would be a pretty good time to have your best season uh, from, from just a perspective standpoint, perception standpoint, how the nation views you as a college football program. It would, it would be nice to have a good season right now because I think about in particular like Iowa State, you know, and the way Iowa State was getting some run there when they were still in the AAU for the Big Ten um, I mean, a lot of that, like that, that was not happening 10 years ago in the, the last round of realignment. It did happen somewhat now because Matt Campbell has kind of put them on the map, probably more so than he should have, but as, as a name, as a team that is competitive and, and can be a really good squad in case state just doesn't have that national perception right now. Yeah, that's fair. But they, I, I just feel like they are turning the corner across the board too. Like you talked about parlaying it into more success. If they can really put together a formidable season this year, but we're, you know, observing and noticing how much better the roster is right now than what he inherited or even what he just had, you know, a year or two ago. It just, it almost feels a little night and day. And like you said, his comments, you can kind of tell that he feels like as a program, they've turned the corner, but I'll say it's across the board. You can almost feel like they, like you said, they get their feet underneath them. They understand what they're doing a bit more because it's not just, the roster that they put together, not just the coaching job that they do, you know, within those 60 minutes during a football game, but I mean, their recruiting has turned a corner. They, I mean, we talked about some of the new additions in the past month, right here on the uh, three mall podcast the last week or two. I mean, they're defeating Florida state, Washington, West Virginia, USC for kids. And now we look at their 2023 recruiting class and yes, they only have three commits right now, but doesn't it feel like they're on the cusp of just, you know, having an incredible June where that three could turn into 10 and those are 10 quality guys with they they probably went neck and neck with some really good power five opponents for, you know, everyone and their brother for Avery Johnson, whether it be Notre Dame for Joe Otte. I mean, they could still lose those battles, but I mean, they're well within the reach of landing those two than they were at this time in other classes. So you can just kind of see the step forward that they've taken just about in every facet of the program. Well, and for Avery Johnson, speaking of, he has now set some dates and this will be something more big picture with the program that you can kind of point to like, hey, if this maybe this is a key domino that falls, maybe this is something that we circle in the same way that I think like 2018, the, I was going to make this point about the Texas game last year and the 2018 Iowa State game. I think you look back at the 2018 Iowa State game as a watershed moment. If that goes a different way, who knows where this program's at or what happens if Bill Snyder is still the head coach in 2019. But that was a domino that fell that put everything in motion right here. The Texas game, as frustrating as that was last year, 
that forced some changes. Chris Kleiman made some changes on the staff. He got rid of his, his childhood buddy and Courtney Messingham, an offensive coordinator. And the early returns, at least in terms of how the players feel on the offense, getting a quarterback like Adrian Martinez to come in, like a lot of things have happened that I don't think happened if that change had not been made. One of those watershed moments, I think, could be landing Avery Johnson here, and we're coming down the home stretch. We are coming down the home stretch on that. He has set up visit dates where he'll be in Washington, at Washington, uh, this week, K-State the 11th, and then the week after that it is Oregon. So, Derek, you've been the one following this recruitment. Avery Johnson, four-star quarterback, very, very special, potential to be a tremendous college quarterback from Mays in the state of Kansas, and K-State's hung in there the entire way through a pretty wild recruitment, now an Elite 11 quarterback, and K-State is on the doorstep of getting it done. What do you make of, of the visits, where, they, where they're at, and where they're positioned, the order of these things? I don't know if I buy into the order a whole lot, if it means anything. He already he had Oregon set before anything, and I also don't think that means anything. Oregon's got you know some other quarterbacks in play as well, and and I still think Kansas State is probably in the best position. So I don't think I just think that was something that you know they scheduled, and uh, and Oregon could have their quarterback. They could land their quarterback that weekend that Avery Johnson visits them. If he's in Eugene June seventeenth, that's when Jaden Rashada makes his choice and. You know, he's someone that Oregon's after as well, and some believe that they're the favorite for him. So uh, that'll be interesting to see how that unfolds because Oregon has their own quarterback dilemma as well. But I don't think I put too much into the order of who's first, who's second, who's third, at least not in this recruitment. Sometimes it matters. I just don't think it does in this one. I think he decided to put Kansas State in front of Oregon and then Washington this weekend because I think he wants his visits done by the middle of the month because he probably wants a gap and a little bit of uh, a deep breath before he goes to Los Angeles at the end of June for the Elite 11 Finals. That's June 28th through the 30th. I, I don't know that he wanted to visit anyone that following weekend, June 24th, just before you know that competition where he probably sees as a you know pretty huge moment in his high school career. You know, that's a pretty distinguished group that gets to go to those kinds of events. So don't make too much into any of the order or the dates or anything of that nature. I think what it tells us is he is adamant that he's going to make his decision and try to put everything behind him before he gets to Los Angeles at the end of June. Well, it's an exciting month. Uh, this is going to be a fun next 30 days on the recruiting trail. And DY, I know you're going to be very busy with everything that's going to be going on there. Uh, you know, talking about Avery Johnson, I want to divert back just real quick to what Adrian Martinez said on our podcast last week. And I would be blasting this out to Avery Johnson if I was Kansas State. Adrian Martinez might be K-State's best recruiting table right now when it comes to, to quarterbacks. When Adrian Martinez brought up Chris Kleiman and his defensive value that he brings to the quarterback coaching room. I thought that was a very unique and interesting perspective. I tweeted out the quote that he had provided and that Chris Kleiman comes into the meeting rooms often and, and educates them on what defensive coverage, defensive technique, what the defense is trying to accomplish there and helps get them prepared for what they're going to see in the NFL and helps them prepare for those meeting rooms with scouts and head coaches when they get into that room. And you look back, it's obviously been a success. I mean, Chris Kleiman's last three starting quarterbacks have been drafted. Adrian Martinez could potentially be the fourth. We also heard Adrian Martinez talk up Colin Klein a great deal, how genuine he is, how authentic he is, the offense that he wants to run, that they feel like they're on the cutting edge of something new here at Kansas State with him as the offensive coordinator, the tempo, et cetera. I don't think there's really any chance of Courtney Messingham still the offensive coordinator that K-State gets Avery Johnson. But because of Colin Klein in place now, I think Kansas State's got a great shot. Obviously, you're, you're great reporting on this, D.Y. I'm feeling uh, pretty optimistic right now. And so uh, if I'm Kansas State, look, some of those comments Adrian Martinez made just about this system, this offense, this coaching staff, I'm blasting those out to Avery Johnson. I, I think K-State's in a great spot here. And they get Avery Johnson. It just starts the domino effect, right, and likely leads to Kansas State getting a lot more talent and weapons around him that will be willing to jump into the fold and D.Y., you could, you could allude on that a little bit probably, but that would certainly not hurt their case probably with guys like Joe Otting and some of the receivers that they're targeting, like a Josh Manning. Yeah, he's he's got that ring leader type of ability, um, even more than you know the typical 
prospect, to be honest, because kids, they, but they, they landed a four-star quarterback in Jake Rubley on New Year's Day. I think it was the day after they lost the Navy Liberty Liberty Bowl. Bowl. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, but that didn't have the same kind of like cascading effect across the recruiting class. This one would be different. Avery Johnson is a lot more, I guess, distinguished, well-known, popular amongst his peers to where he does that. And especially maybe some of the Kansas city or, or Kansas kids, I think that it would take, take them um, on a pretty significant level. I think they would be impacted. I'm not saying, Oh, automatically boom, 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 boom. There's going to be four or five, six more commits, but his commitment to Kansas state would hold a lot much more sway than any kid that they've ever landed since I've covered the team. And obviously that goes back to September of 2017. So almost going on five years at this point. So he has the kind of ability to attract other talent that might not otherwise be available to them. Which is why uh, I go back to you talking about watershed moments. That is a huge part of it. What what is the domino effect talent wise? Who else do you then pull in Uh, massive local recruiting win, massive kid who can be the cornerstone of your program for the next, however many years, like there, there are so many elements of that where I think that, could absolutely be one of the biggest days, if not the biggest day of the, the Chris Kleiman era so far, if it were to happen. And interestingly enough, think about this, you know, as much as we talk about and think about K-State not being a recruiting powerhouse, if Avery Johnson does commit and assuming that he plays pretty early in his career, I mean, we're talking about K-State going from Skylar Thompson, who was a four-star quarterback coming out of high school to now Adrian Martinez, who was a four-star quarterback coming out of high school to, Uh, Jake Rubley's on the roster and he's a four-star quarterback and then potentially turning it over to Avery Johnson, another four-star quarterback. So for all the uh, shortcomings of Bill Snyder at the end of his tenure and for some of the shortcomings recruiting wise for this staff, when they first got started, they actually have done a pretty good job at quarterback, which is the most important thing that you can do. Yeah. Hats off to Colin Klein for that Uh, trivia, trivia question. I'm sure you guys probably know you're pretty good historians for Kansas state football. Who was the last quarterback to start a game for Kansas State that played and that was a part of the Elite 11 finals? Oh, Josh Freeman. Yeah, 2005, I think he was in the Elite 11 class. My guy, man, Josh Freeman. Uh, those are the days. Dude, don't uh, hate Josh Freeman, okay? Hate Ron Prince. Don't hate Josh Freeman. Ironically, a flip from Nebraska, right? Yes, yes, he sure was. <laughs> that was a big deal. That was a big deal at the time. Uh, we have not talked much basketball recruiting here. It's been a little more quiet, although we did get the cat signal from Jerome Tang over the weekend. And we've seen this lately. Uh, the cat signal seems to precede the actual commitment being announced by a couple of days. We don't have it yet, but I don't think that you'll have to be in Gessen for too long because <laughs> it appears that it's David in uh, the Virginia Tech transfer. Uh, D.Y.L., I'll let you have the floor as far as that's concerned. A- am I pronouncing that name correctly? Does it work I mean, with my pun? I, I, I mean, I've heard that pun like a hundred times at this point. So, All from um, me, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> but I, I've been saying Gasson. I, I think the end's silent, but I don't know. You're, you're the, uh, closed the whole thing up. Come on. Damn it, yeah. John. We talked about this on the podcast two weeks ago. We were going yeah, with Gasson. Did we talk about that, this? Yes. You have you, to look and, at the phonetic. You have to look you, at the phonetics, John. You have to go to the, the you have to go to the notes before a game. Remember, oh, and then you right. got to check those. Remember how we talked about you educated yeah. us on that. Do you yeah. have time to do that right now, John? Uh, you, you guys, you guys talk. I'll, I'll figure it out. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's a transfer from Virginia Tech, and obviously, we're pretty certain that he is the outstanding commit, um, so to speak, at this point. Uh, and that would give Kansas State eight guys. Um, the question is, is how he kind of fits into the picture um, and they defeated, I think Virginia tech for him. I think the, I think the biggest competition, and that's not to say he wasn't a wanted guy. He had several programs in pursuit of him, but I think that the stiffest competition for K state was that the Virginia tech staff still wanted him. So that's probably a good sign, right? A guy that's been there multiple years and the staff in Blacksburg didn't want him to leave. Um, so Kansas state's getting a wanted man in that nature. I guess we're going to find out how he's going to be utilized. Was he utilized right at Virginia Tech? I, I couldn't tell you. I guess he look, he plays like a three, maybe minus the shooting acumen, in a four's body. That's how I would kind of describe him. More of a slashing three that doesn't – I mean, the shooting numbers aren't that great. That's that's the one knock I would have on him. But, but you know, he's he's got a – he does have a unique tool set, I think, where he's got some versatility to him. He's going to be able to defend multiple positions. He's athletic. 
Uh, the shooting numbers, it, it's kind of a small sample size. I think he attempted 15 threes. He made three last year. So, I mean, there's not a lot out there on him being able to shoot the ball, but maybe he could improve upon that. I will say Virginia Tech's system, I mean, they rely on their their kind of bigs, versatile three, fours to be able to really shoot it. And um, I don't know, maybe he, he can develop into that aspect of the game. Maybe it's just something he hasn't showcased yet, but I will say that I think he has some tools that Kansas State can work with. I think he's a very good ball screen type guy that can roll to the basket, uh, can handle the ball, put it on the floor a little bit. I think he can get after it on the boards. Um, I think he brings some things to the table. He isn't the high pedigree recruit that a lot of these other guys were coming out of high school. I think he was ranked around the 400th player in the country, but he's from the Netherlands, so the evaluations could be off a little bit. And I think to your point, D.Y., I believe Virginia Tech was planning on him to probably start this next year. He was ready to take on that role as a starter. I saw their lead assistant, their their best recruiter comment on his Instagram, you're bluffing when it came to the transferring. <laughs> I mean, he clear they they did not want him to go. And I, I think that's often that's often a best sign, a good sign when it comes like they know him better than anyone because he's been in their program two years and they wanted him to stick around. So they obviously could, see some potential. Could you imagine like Nigel Pack put something like on Instagram and then like Coach Tang or Coach Malgi just like responds, you're bluffing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more like a Marquise Noel. Oh, the- uh, Gasson, oh, yeah. by the way, Gasson. Oh, I was right. Gasson, yes. Uh, Cole, thank you for calling me out. I deserve that one. It, I, I realized we didn't we didn't talk about him specifically, right? But it was with somebody else where I was like trying to flex about my big broadcaster brain. Shaku, yeah, Shaku. Which we're we're guessing on that one too. Still, we haven't confirmed that pronunciation, but we may not need to know it because his recruitment has been absurdly quiet since he took that visit. Very. Strange one. Yeah. Very difficult to to track where that one's going. Um, so anyway, it was Gasson the the name of Beauty on the Beast. Uh was that the name of Gaston? Yeah, I think that's right? Gaston. Gaston, okay. Yeah. I I yeah. I haven't not I, I have daughters now, so I was just trying oh, to so, educate so, myself. So do we call him the beast then? Is he the, be- <laughs> the beast? The beast. I, I said I wouldn't get us off topic this time, guys. So I'll ignore my comment about Gaston. Okay, well, one final, Cole, I feel like this is your time to shine because you're the one that's been, you know, Instagram stalking all these recruits and transfers for us here. So NBA (laughs) draft withdrawal deadline comes today. Jerome Tang has referenced a couple of times that, hey, there are some guys that were going through the NBA draft process that we were waiting on. Now it's like, okay, who are these guys? Is it Emmanuel Acott from Boise State? Is it Kerwin Walton of North Carolina? Who, Who could potentially be in play here? What is your sleuthing telling you? Well, D.Y. can you know, speak to this as well. And, and Flando, Grant Flanders from K-State Online and our, our group text, they noted both that uh, Jerome Tang and Eric Malagy followed Emmanuel Acott on Twitter in the last couple of days. I believe Jerome Tang followed him yesterday. This is all recent activity that has just occurred. Acott is pulled out of the draft. He's a six foot eight, uh, kind of swing, can play the three can really handle the basketball, actually. He could probably play a little bit of the two if you really needed him to, but he's ideally at the three position uh, with his length. He was the number 26 recruit out of the country, out of high school, five-star kid, went to the University of Arizona, played 10 minutes per game his freshman year, then played 19 minutes per game his second season at Arizona. So he got some playing time there under Sean Miller, but that was when at a time when Arizona was kind of really going through some struggles. Transferred to Boise State, Average nine points per game last year and then nearly 11 points per game this past season on a really good Boise State team that was an eight seed in the NCAA tournament. He's a guy that can put the ball on the floor. He's a career 36% three-point shooter on 274 attempts from three, so it's not a small sample size. He can shoot the basketball. He gives you more length. I mean, gosh, if you get him and Gasson, if you got ACOT as well, that makes seven – is it seven guys on the roster that out of the nine on scholarship that would be six foot eight or taller? It's up there. Yeah. I mean, that kind of goes to a little bit of the conversation that we've had been having amongst ourselves, right? Not, not necessarily on the podcast, but like, it just seems like they're very heavy at the three and the four where you you do kind of wonder at some point, where are the twos for this team? And I know they've been chasing Kerwin Walton, the North Carolina transfer as well, but that, I guess we probably don't feel as optimistic about that one. It doesn't feel like it's going their way. We could be wrong. We're just looking at context clues and, you know, little nuggets here and there. I mean, think about the way we're we're trying to cover recruiting right now. It's, it's who followed who on Twitter. I mean, I don't think we, if we listen to ourselves 
right now, like eight years ago, we'd be like, what are, what are these guys talking about? So it's, it's a different world, it's a different era. But I do wonder, I mean, at some point, you, you, we used to call them shooting guards, but just a guard that can really fill it up from the outside. I don't know that that's on the roster even at this point or one that they're really in the discussion with. Let me, let me throw one name out. And, and again, this is more speculative because it, it's going off Instagram followers, right? It looks like Eric Malagy recently followed David Jenkins Jr., who's a six foot one really type shooting guard that started at South Dakota state averaged 16 points per game as a freshman, nearly 20 points per game as a sophomore. You'll remember when TJ Otzelberger left South Dakota state, went to UNLV, David Jenkins entered the transfer portal and was one of the most coveted transfers in America. He's a big time shooter and he's a career 41% shooter from three great catch and shooter shoot type guy. Uh, you know, he, he shot the ball like 500 times from three in his career. I mean, he can really, shoot it. And that's a guy that Kansas State could utilize on their roster. He went to UNLV. He averaged 15 points per game at UNLV. And then he transferred again. And he was at Utah this last year, averaged around nine points per game, had his minutes cut, only played about 19, 20 minutes a game for whatever reason. I'm not, I'm not sure why his minutes were cut, but that is a guy that is a grad transfer in the portal right now that, you know, Kansas State may have a shot at. They may be looking at, he seems like he could be a fit if they got a caught and then a guy like David Jenkins Jr., uh, I think that's a fit. You, you then got two guys that can shoot the ball on ACOT and Jenkins that will surround some of these bigs that Kansas State has brought in. So we'll see what they do there. But yeah, I think that's certainly a possibility outside of that. You guys mentioned Kerwin Walton. He's a guy that I really would like because he's six foot five and can play the two or the three. And he's a career 40% three point shooter, another former top 100 recruit. And he did it on the big stage at North Carolina as a freshman. He averaged nearly nine points per game had his minutes cut back this last year as a sophomore, but still a couple years of eligibility. I don't, I don't feel as optimistic, but again, like you said, DY, I'm only basing that on the fact that only Marco Bourne follows him on any of the social media accounts. They don't follow him at all on Instagram and only coach Bourne follows him on Twitter. So that's the only reason, but we, he did list K state as one of his top five schools, but there's some stiff competition there. Yeah. The basketball thing, I mean, fair to, to kind of wrap up this discussion, fair to say that, and look, I would love for them to be able to land one or two of these guys that you're talking about that are a little bit more proven at the uh, at the Power Five Division One level. I just feel like no matter what, it's going to be a, kind of a guessing game as to what exactly this team is going to be because there is so much. There are so many guys that like fit the profile of a Gasson, fit the profile of a Colbert, like either great recruiting pedigree and incredible athleticism, but not that much production or somewhere in between, right? They're all similar profiles like that. And they're all very long and big. It's going to be, it's going to look a lot different than it did last year. We have really no idea what the, the style of this is going to be. Is it going to be a zone? How many of these guys will start to realize their full potential? How many of these guys are like actually ready to really contribute right away? Um, I just feel like we're at a point where no matter what, it, it, for a while I had this hope and, and probably an unfair hope that like, hey, maybe one of these five stars will land. Maybe one of these major, major proven score transfers like an Antoine Davis will land. And you would have a little more like sure idea of what the roster is going to be and what the team's going to look like. I feel like we're, we're kind of past the point of no return on that. I would agree. I guess something I keep coming back to, and it's a little interesting because I know they're going to have some guys bolt for the roster that they are assembling. I think Marquise Noel is probably in his final year, I want to say, but it seems <laughs> it's almost like they're built to play in two years, not necessarily this upcoming year. And I'm not even knocking it. It's just not probably in the era of instant gratification, what a lot of people want to see. And it's not even to say they can't compete this year. I mean, they kind of competed last year and, you know, he had a almost like a band of misfits um, surrounding Nigel Pack. At least that's what we thought, you know, at the, beginning of the year or before well, the season look, we, we know from jerome tang who was coaching for the defending national champions that there were only two other players on the roster that he felt like were big 12 caliber players returning he probably thought mark smith i would assume okay but, uh, yes fa fair enough fair enough yes. yeah so i guess I, I think it's a team that can be competitive this season but they're really built you know if you look at their eligibility and just the upside of guys kind of being somewhat of a projects here and there as well. When you, you know, think of the guys that they've added, they're really built to be really good two seasons from now. Well, on that point, DY, I mean, you bring that up. 
look at what they're doing on the 2023 recruiting show right now. You, maybe you could touch on this a little bit with their where they're at with Layden Blocker and then Day Day Ames, if I'm saying that correctly, both top yeah, 50 I mean, recruits in America. Yeah, I mean, they're both great guards in the class of 2023. And if they've made a dent with any high school prospects that are nationally renowned, it is those two. Now, I'm not going to go and say they're definitely landing both of these guys, but they are in the game for Layden Blocker. And he's a near five-star from Sunrise Academy. They're going up against Kansas and Arkansas for him. I know he visited Maryland too, but I would imagine Kansas and Arkansas are the competition. And, you know, we're having conversations with those around him that would suggest that the Wildcats are definitely in consideration. It's not a place that was just a courtesy visit. And then with Ames, it's hard pressed to find a school that probably feels as good as about as well as about him as Kansas state does. And I think he's a top 50 recruit on just about every recruiting service as well. So those um, guards are on the way um, that are really well thought of, but it might be, you know, not this season, maybe next, but we might be sleeping on Cam Carter too. I wonder. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's a guy that probably has more scoring potential now, um, even for this season, than is given credit for. Well, and that's what I mean. I kind of, if you're talking about playing for uh, next year or a couple of years down the road, and I know like nobody really stays anymore in college basketball, it can be a little dangerous to do that. Mm-hmm. But it feels like they have enough of these guys that fit the same profile where they're almost like lottery ticket esque and if you, you'll hit probably on one or two of them i mean whether it's going to be cam carter and i when i say hit i mean like hit in, in a big way like i'm sure a lot of these guys can contribute but you know if it's carter and colbert if it's carter and gasson like you hit on two guys who are like fully realizing their potential and are studs then man i mean look at look at what that can lead to in 2023 if you find a way to get laden blocker into the fold one of those guys like now we're really talking and you can see how this thing would really build it's just to me the question is going to be like, what does next year actually look like? And many of these guys have to stay um, if they're not grad transfers because they just used up yeah. their free transfer. Yeah, you're right. Some of the benefit there. All right. Uh, reminder: go check out Ben Holiday bottled uh, in. Excuse me, Ben Holiday bottled in Bond Bourbon from Holiday Distillery, 360 Vodka. Appreciate the support of Holiday Distillery. As always, whatever it is that you're celebrating this weekend, make sure you're doing so with Holiday Distillery and appreciate the work that they do to support us here on the pod. It's going to wrap it up for us. For Derek Young, for Cole Manbeck, I'm John Kurtz. Appreciate Tucker Franklin behind the scenes as well. We will talk to you next time on Free Market.